welcome to the Digital Pond. Um, so firstly, let's get to meet our panel, um, starting with Harry here. Uh, just tell us where you're from and uh, which company you're from and what you think has been the biggest and most significant changes of the last year in digital marketing. Hi everybody, like uh, Matt said, my name's Harry Clark. I'm the marketing manager at Cyberduck. We're kind of, uh, a full service digital agency, um, specializing in user experience, web development, and offering kind of like consultancy services to our clients. Um, looking into the kind of like the biggest changes within the last year from personal experience, I would kind of say the shift to mobile. I know a lot of people were talking about it 12 months ago, but from kind of our experience, we see, I think we see a lot more companies actually embracing it and looking to put budgets towards mobile, which is great. Um, and again, from the other f the, the other thing from my experience is you know the the change Google algorithms have had, especially in the early part of the year. You know things like Penguin and Panda. There was certainly a, a lot of work around cleaning up links and cleaning up backlink profiles, which involved a lot of time and effort. So you know they're two of the big things that I'd say we've worked on this year. Hi everyone, I'm David. I'm a consultant in the digital team at a PR company called Blue Rubicon. Um, I think. Um, over the past 12 months, for me, the, the biggest change has been um, the rise of content and quality content and um, everyone seems to be very obsessed about content at the moment. So we've got sites like BuzzFeed which have uh, increased, um, they've doubled over the past year their amount of content. We've got sites like medium.com and subtle.com um, who are uh, creating great quality long form content without any um, marketing fluff which is obviously a bit of a challenge for us um, and they, they sort of make the Huffington Post and sites like that look really really old school um, and then we've got even um, other content sites that are um, purely apps like the magazine on the iPhone which um, again has only been around for 12 months and it started off as one guy who wanted to create long form articles and now he's got a whole team of writers um, paying them a, a hell of a lot of money and going to be creating a book and I think uh, as 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 brands and people managing brands, we need to um, make the most of this this content specific um, content led dynamic that's going on because what the audience want now is great content. Hello, you all right? Um, I'm Alex. I'm from uh, an agency called Manifest. Um, we specialise in all sorts of communication, so I guess we're more about ideas than we are about specific services, so it's PR, social media, charm, charisma, um, modesty, all of that sort of stuff. Um, we um, work across all different industries, uh, so I think it's quite interesting to look at, um, for in terms of what the biggest thing for the last 12 months is, to look at the consistencies, and often that's not necessarily just the opportunities, it's what people shit themselves about. Um, and I think Snapchat is probably one of those things where everyone's like, God, we can't do anything with that. I think that's really interesting because when you talk about content being massively important and now everyone's so everyone has content plans for the week, content plans for the month, content plans for the year. Um, you know, how are we going to produce all that content? But what happens if consumers just dispose of it immediately? Um, I think everyone's bricking it about that a bit. So that's quite interesting um, because out of every problem, everything that um, people are scared of, there's always a big opportunity. So although that's one little splash in the digital pond, I guess, um, it's something that I found the most interesting in the last 12 months. Great, okay. I'm quite a mixed bag, so I'll try and keep this short. Um, I started life inventing the Churchill Winston dog insurance idea, so that, or oh, no, he's my idea, so I'm sorry if he's still annoying you 20 years later on. Um, I spent 16 years in the music industry as a music professional producer, I worked with some of the biggest acts in the world, I then went to run the number one private training company in the city, training 90% of the top 250 firms, that's a very challenging job to do. I'm now involved with a startup called Reform Productions, which has the largest green screen in the southeast, so film, TV and music still a big theme. And obviously I, I'm right across digital and traditional marketing, so one of the things I'm going to try and help talk to you today is how traditional actually can really support your digital uh, marketing. Um, I do agree with a lot of content dynamic change, that's definitely a big feeling coming through, especially businesses and also getting them to really understand its basic values and things like LinkedIn. Still a lot of people don't have a digital strategy for staff and businesses to grow their own marketing tools. Excellent. Okay. Um, so the first subject which we are going to talk about, it's actually something which you've, you've all already mentioned mostly, um, is going to be social media. 
So it has been an incredible year in terms of the, I guess you could call it fragmentation of social media. Um, we've seen different social media channels come up and we've seen different people using them in, in incredible ways. Um, my first question to the panel would be, are we likely to see spend now start to move away from Facebook and Twitter? And also, how are, brown, how are brands looking to approach utilizing these new channels? And what I'll do is I'll uh, anybody who wants to take it. Just cool. Um, yeah, I'll, just, I'll give this um, a start. I think in terms of in terms of kind of like the marketing that we're looking to plan, I still think there's a big kind of emphasis, especially towards uh, towards Facebook. If you look at the kind of stats, they do they do have a massive reach with uh, you know one billion active users, and I've, you know I've seen statistics that saying that 68% of marketers are, are planning to spend more money on Facebook advertising next year. So there's a lot to suggest that Facebook's going to be uh, going to be the place to kind of uh, to look at and invest in. Um, you know, I think as well with with uh, with Facebook, they're they're, go they're going to be doing a lot to kind of offer improve their service as well, which is going to make it more appealing to us as advertisers. Uh, read about kind of uh, they're going to launch a video ad service very soon. It's something they've been trialing at the moment, and we could potentially see them launching very soon. Uh, they've kind of got the, uh, the keyword insights API, so it's picking up on kind of like our open uh, social social uh, what we uh, share socially, uh, and you know trying to aggregate all that data and allowing us to kind of segment it. There's a, they obviously launched the hashtag feature, so you can see that a lot is kind of going on uh, in you know in a, such a popular social avenue as Facebook. Uh, and I think that's going to appeal to a lot of advertisers to stay on there. Um, and you know, you, you, there obviously are there are new kind of social social media avenues coming through, and you know they, they shouldn't be ignored. But I'm, in terms of kind of like a paid, you know, the places like Snapchat and Instagram, they haven't kind of got a paid plat platform yet. So maybe people won't be investing as much money in those kind of places until maybe they they d uh, adopt one. Um, so I'm going to be quite boring and sort of agree, but um, <laughs> maybe build upon it a little bit. Um, I think Snapchat definitely, the di disposable networks are definitely um, a key trend for next year that I've seen, and I think Snapchat is huge, and that yeah, we are shitting it because we don't know what to do with Snapchat. Um, I think Snapchat is an interesting one. There was recently a, a stat that went around um, showing that it sh has more pictures shared. Um, than on Facebook. It's interesting though when you actually look into that data every um, when someone shares a picture on Snapchat to um, say 10 people that's then classed as 10 images so it's you know it's interesting like how how big is Snapchat really we well, I don't think we actually know we know the inflated stuff at the moment and I think um, it'd be great to use these other channels to um, promote on and to you know have, have have more business solutions from there, but um, it really is Twitter and Facebook that are um, bringing out the big guns here. So Twitter's now released um, the self-serve, um, they've rolled that, rolled that out so you can now do your ads yourself. Um, those Facebook um, ad tools are great, and I, th I think just um, uh, to point out there, um, I really like their custom audiences um, tool that they have, so you can, you can even plug in a brand CMS. Um, it, uh, databases into Facebook to find where they are on Facebook and then you can even create lookalike audiences so you can find people who are like the customers you already have and then build out from that so I think I really think Facebook is um, a, a big player here and I think while a lot of people would um, like to use the other channels like Snapchat and I, I'd, I'd absolutely love to um, try and work out a strategy for using it um, I think Facebook and Twitter are, are are still massive and will only improve next year. Um, yeah, I'm inclined to agree in terms of um, the um, the actual networks themselves. I think Facebook and Twitter are so dominant um, that there's not really anyone going to just arrive and challenge them immediately. But I think that their natural product development is going to be quite interesting because they'll look at people like Snapchat and see how they can mirror. Um, that type of activity and that type of content, um, but I actually think that with um, if you look at Facebook as being, I guess, the driving force of the industry, um, if there is an industry around social media, I guess there is. We're all sat in a room, um, so I, I think with them, they're going to be so focused on the Asian market 
um, that's where their biggest growth it, it potential is, that you'll find they'll actually build themselves into the workings of a smartphone more. They're going to be much more focused on the mobile experience, on the lightweight experience, uh, which means it will all be about mirroring things like um, Kick, Line and Snapchat. So it will be text messaging, it will be free video conferencing, free video calls, trying to bring that to the forefront of what they do. Um, so weirdly, to taking a step back in terms of how people would use social media, it's not necessarily advancing how we would use it, it's basically making it more of an integral part of your day-to-day -day communications and replacing the phone rather than necessarily replacing other social networks. Um, because that's what China wants, uh, they want quick immediate text messages and if you crack China then you crack the market. Um, then I would also say private networks are um, going to be proliferating um, again. Um, so things like Path started a really cool trend for networks that um, have a limited number of people that you can connect with, but Path didn't really, doesn't really have um, any dedicated reason for being. Um, something like MySpace, for example, I think will become much much bigger again um, in the next 12 months because it has a reason for being, and that's music. Um, you'll find lots of networks around specific things and specific interests, um, and even within the professional world, you're already seeing it, and that could be quite interesting in terms of how, what does that mean for um, anyone who's putting a content plan together or a strategy for targeting social media. And I think the lesson to learn there is um, there should never having a Facebook page isn't a strategy. You know, being on Twitter isn't a strategy. Like the idea, you know, the concept should always be, I guess, tactic agnostic. It should be it should work across the whole media spectrum from broadsheets to blogs. And if that idea does that, it doesn't matter what changes on social media. Um, and I think that's probably a bigger topic than okay, we should be creating this type of content, that type of content. No, just have the idea and then the content can be delivered across anything that you need to. Um, and then the final thing, I think from a looking at next year point of view, um, I would say TV is going to be the biggest thing for social media. Um, so smart TVs have been around for ages, no one uses them properly. Um, we've got one in the office, I don't think I've ever used it from a the social media point of view. Um, but TVs are in every single living room. Um, just like everyone says, the reason why social me social media has taken off so much in developing markets is because of the mobile handset. Um, TV is the next stage to going absolutely mainstream. And the idea of double screening, I think, is becoming so common, and broadcasters are building around it. And the death of the schedule, um, what's the difference between Netflix and Channel 4? Um, all of that is really interesting and it has a big impact on social. I think The Guardian is probably the first news outlet to not call itself a newspaper anymore. It's a news brand. Again, it's an idea and the content's delivered wherever you are. Um, and I think that's something that's going to be really interesting next year is, is TV actually going to be socially driven? You know, when, when's the first TV program that's going to be filmed and uploaded to social media? Um, when's going to be the, the first debate where the winners decided the questions are asked through social media? Um, that's very interesting as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, sounds like the future of TV. Good. Um, I think it's really important to understand with the spend on Facebook and Twitter is a lot of the people that decide spend in big brands are pretty nervous about the marketing budgets at the moment. Um, and to get onto new and exciting platforms, which I'll show you, view is great. And they're very nervous about spending twenty, thirty thousand pounds if you have that kind of money on a decent campaign. So I think that the tried and tested methods are going to stick with us for a while until they get some real proof that it's going to work or drive some decent sales. Um, interesting enough, the the music industry with content has you know the fashion industry have joined particularly. So things like Burberry and Superdrive just pointed heads of music to go through social media to improve their strategies. So they believe that other people's branding content through other things like TV and social are really important. And I know that a lot of the entertainment brands are focusing ad revenues on second screen strategies. So when you're watching X Factor and you're updating it from your iPad and stuff, that business model is not explored enough yet. And I know that there's thousands of pounds worth of interest in that per day going in from the big media brands. So. So, um, okay. Thank you, guys. Um, so, I think you, uh, the, the kind of general was going on to then go there was that as much as we have seen the emergence of, uh, I guess, the fragmentation of smaller channels, people are still, I guess, mostly going to the mainstream Facebook, Twitter. Um, have there not been many examples or good examples of the sort of smaller social media being adopted? Do you not see that as being somewhere we're, we're going to be heading with? Uh, I know, as Alex, you said, it's all about the message and obviously getting the idea right. 
across with the key, but we have seen more statistics coming up showing that people are actually starting to use Facebook less, I guess, for the younger generation. Um, how, I guess, would you go about formulating or, formulate, or using, formulating a campaign or a strategy using the personal social media? How would you convince a client to do that? <laughs> yeah, I think there's adopting new social media. If, if looked at the strategic side of things, adopting new channels isn't that much of a struggle, as long as you appreciate that the risk is the uptake. Um, if you listen, I mean, social media for a start, everyone talks about broadcasting content, which is great. That's exactly what you're doing a lot of the time. But in PR, we always talked about creating water cooler moments um, and being the topic of conversation on the tip of everyone's tongue. The beauty of social media is you can be a fly on the wall at every water cooler in every office in the country and listen to what people are saying so that you get the content right. And I think as long as you're listening to where people are, are and which water coolers the conversation is relevant to you, then be there. Um, so the main thing is if you listen, then you'll be there. And the good brands are already doing that, I think. And that's where the channels, when they arrive, need to almost have a place for the brands to to sit and, and to be. Um, but in terms of people competing with Facebook, there's lots of little ones, but the thing is, we're not the only ones saying who's the next Facebook. The guys at Facebook's acquisitions department are probably doing exactly the same thing, um, which is why there's so many inflated prices and Instagram can sell for a billion dollars because um, it's the only competitor to Facebook in image sharing, so why not just buy it? And I think you'll see that more and more as, as Facebook's now a public company. It's it's got to go and do that um, and be aggressive in the market. So it's, it's it's not a happy world, really. Well, it is for the startups because they get to sell to Facebook. But I think for a brand, it's a dangerous world investing in stuff. The biggest mistake you can make is trying to build your own. Um, and I think that was an interesting project with Ning when they tried to make, OK, we well can create your own social networks. That was great. But it's not a case of if you build it, they will come. And I think people are seeing that with apps already. Um, you've got to have a reason to exist and a reason to be there. So. That was a really roundabout way of saying absolutely nothing. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, the tiny networks, there's not one that I think is going to really catch on. But I, I, the size of Facebook, because you've always got Facebook there, is this like, I don't know, giant building block. But that's the exciting thing in communications is okay, well, where's our audience? Where's our niche? Where's our message? And finding where that exists. And it could be on path, it could be doing something with Snapchat. It depends on the audience and what they're saying. Um, so I, th I think there's um, one channel that I've seen really great opportunity with, which I, I suppose because it's owned by Twitter, um, it's kind of one of the big ones, but um, Vine is, is really quite interesting. And um, even though it is owned by Twitter, it is, it's still very quite small um, when you compare it to Instagram um, and you know, more, more mainstream, um, less niche. Um, social channels, but what what I love about Vine is um, how I've seen marketers adapt to it so quickly, and even s massive brands like General Electric, um, they they've taken on these new Vine celebrities that didn't exist a year ago, and um, they're just random people who make funny six-second clips, um, and they're now working with the likes of Ashton Kutcher and General Electric. Um, to go up into, um, I think they sent them up to space um, and doing really cool stuff. And it, it kind of stems from the, the whole YouTube um, marketing business around, um, you know, high profile vloggers who get sent products or, you know, get paid to um, do videos um, to, to promote um, big brands. And they, they can really um, charge um, a, a hell of a lot of money. It's really obscene considering that these people are just, you know, I could have done it if I was actually funny. So yeah, I think Vine's been really interesting and, and now um, the a lot of the time it's always um, people in the US that are getting the biggest audiences but there's been quite a few um, UK um, Vine people. I don't really know what we call people on Vine. Um, but that have been doing brand things, and especially with the likes of Line and Kick, they've been promoting those networks as well. Because I think it just it fits in very well. So I think I think it'll be interesting to watch how Vine improves over time, and how more marketers use those kind of new celebrities, um, who probably have more right to be called a celebrity than anyone in Big Brother, for example. So. Yeah, well, just kind of, I think with the kind of emerging social channels, I think 
you know, one of the, one of the things that are quite challenged for, for them, and s still even with kind of like your Facebook and your Twitters, is trying to kind of like justify the kind of like return on interest, and that's maybe why people are still sticking with Facebook and Twitter as more of a safe bet because they do have kind of analytical tools out there to help you monitor how well it's going. But I think that's probably something that's going against these smaller, f the, you know, these sm the people that are trying to in on their kind of market is the fact they probably don't have the analytical tool it's, it's so hard to kind of judge success with social media um, so you know in terms of people investing in there you know they, they, they want to you know if you're, you're reporting to your manager or your directors they want to see kind of like uh, hard data really don't they, they want to see numbers of what are you going to invest in I think that's why people might shy away from the kind of smaller ones because it's, it's hard to justify the kind of spend on places like Snapchat. It's hard. To, it's hard to justify the spend on places like Facebook at the moment, but it's even harder for the small players. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, what for one question which kind of came up, or one topic which came up on the panel last year was, um, and this will probably be the last question I ask on, on social media, guys, would be um, Google Plus. We haven't really spoken. Or well, no one's actually really mentioned Google Plus yet this evening. Um, it was predicted on the on the panel last year that Google Plus was it was the future and it was going to be the kind of the be all and end all of social media. I think uh, Lawrence Burrell said that last year. Um, how have we seen? I mean, have I mean, was it correct? Is is Google Plus the future, or you know, or is, it, or is it really pretty much flogging a dead horse right now? I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's. It's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because it, they've got great sign-up to it. Um, but I, I struggle to find clients that are using it regularly. Uh, a lot of young people in digital that I, I kind of talk to are like, why do I need to have a Google Hangout with you? I can Skype you. I can do it another way. I can do it from my phone. Um, and I, I just think for me, it, it was probably a great idea. But I think the other brands around it offer equally great ideas in other ways. Um, um, for me, I find it a little bit complicated. For you know, it's, it's this massive onerous machine that you you sign in here and they own you and they buy half of your house and they just take a picture of it. it. Just it's real complicated stuff. And I think you get it rammed down your throat. And typically, if it's just organic growth, which they do very very well, you can't rule it out yet. But for me, I don't think the adoptions. It's a have to have measure at the moment. Um, in saying that they might revamp it. I think it could do with a bit of a rebrand for me. I think the, it looks a bit tired already. The other brands are catching up and redoing things. So particularly things like vSnap that I've seen recently, something from the States that have come through, that, that's really cool. And that offers to me a quicker way of doing Google Hangouts. Um, yeah, I think um, Google Plus is in danger of becoming the Sinclair C5 of the industry, um, where it's something everyone knows about but no one actually uses. Um, but it's not necessarily because it doesn't work, it does, but we were talking about it before and I think migration in social networks is really rare. So if you're duplicating something that Facebook does, it's unlikely people are going to shift from Facebook to do it unless there's a real value add. Um, so I think Google taking on Facebook, it was a bit of a, a silly decision, but it was a, sort of built around the mentality Google always has of what if we invented social networks now, how would we invent them? But the fact is, social networks were never invented by the, the, the inventors. So, like Biz Stone says, Twitter is um, a product of the community, not of them. They didn't invent hashtags, at messages, direct messages. All of that was invented by people using Twitter. Um, they, just invent, they just created text messages on a web page and then let everyone else do the, um, the MPD for them. And I think Google um, never really does that. It does the open source thing quite well, but then it never really throws it out it has too many secrets and it tries to build everything too much and overthinks things. However, having said that, um, I think that Google Plus might work as almost like Vine does, not a network on its own, but as a distribution mechanic for content. So Google Helpouts launched like this week, I think, probably launched ages ago, I just noticed it this week. But um, I think that's a really in innovative use of the Hangouts, because like, get, giving people, okay, you can do video conference, it's like what, like Skype? Um, yeah, you know, it's just basically the same thing. But help out sounds much better because it is a real interface and it's a way for brands to connect with their audiences directly en masse or individually. And I think that that's really interesting. So looking at specific uses and trying to use their technology for that is probably the best way for them to go. So essentially becoming one of those little networks 
um, but all over the place, rather than trying to take on Facebook, which is it's basically your 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 phone or your TV set. It's so standardised now that yeah, kids are probably using it less, but they're not necessarily aborting the use of it. It's just because their mum's on it. That's all. Um, I'd say that there's um, a particular importance to it. It's, it. It is a weird one. It's um, I was looking at the stats about. Um, two months ago, so it might have changed since then, but in terms of active users, they've actually got more active users than Twitter, so which makes them the second biggest social network. Now that must be everyone who just logs into Gmail or YouTube, um, because no one is going on there. Like I, um, I like to think that I'm in a bit of a social media bubble, um, and um, probably see more than you know my friends on Facebook would see active on Google Plus, and I see very little on there. Um, but but the one thing that I do really like is um, when I'm logged into Google and do a search, and if my friends have written a blog post about this, that will come up um, in the algorithm because of my Google Plus connections. And I think that's kind of key for when we're thinking about our audiences. Um, so if we know that our influencers, the people we want to reach, um, or communities um, are on Google Plus, then um, then it becomes uh, useful to you know have that um, uh, have the authorship set up for ourselves. Um, but in terms of uh, Facebook, I don't think, it, or or even Twitter, I don't think it's um, going to take on them. I, I think the only reason that people actually use it is because of YouTube comments and now Google Plus, and because people log in and because it you know the, when it came out that big massive arrow, you just had to click it to set up Google Plus. So I think that's the only reason that people are on there, but. It does have, um, this is probably the only SEO kind of focused answer that I'm going to give today. Um, it, it does seem to be really good, great for personal SEO. Yeah, um, just to kind of, uh, from kind of like a search search marketing background, uh, I know there's probably a lot of people that don't love Google Plus, but from from the way I look at it, it's actually like quite vital, probably one of the most important social networks. You know, I'm not talking if you're using it, if you're intending to use it the same way you would Facebook, uh, that's not what I'd advise, but there's kind of so many benefits for a search marketer of why they should be using Google Plus. Uh, you can obviously create, uh, you can create uh, business pages which would, you can come up in the localised listings. Uh, you can add your social media page to like PPC, uh, so using like social extensions. Um, and and it's these, it's, there's, like you said, Google authorship as well. There's all these kind of like different, as a search marketer, these are the things that are going to help, you know, in, with search engine rankings, um, so kind of looking at it from a search search point of view, I think it is you know if search is a part of your overall marketing strategy and it's quite a big part of it, it's definitely not something you should overlook in favour because you know it does have it it does have some unique points about it which makes it quite appealing. Great. Thanks. So, so moving on um, to the next topic, um, big data has been I guess a massive buzzword. Uh, if you like, over the last 12 months and probably a little bit before that as well. Um, we've seen it a lot uh, in the news recently with um, these sort of conflicts of how much information about it is, is being shared and how much information about it is, is secure. But also, I guess more importantly, is it, or more importantly to marketers, it's how do we tackle and how do we, can we actually use big data? Um, what I guess my question to the panel would be is, Especially for small, small to medium-sized entities, how how are we using big data? How, what's the best way to use big data, and how has it affected your work as marketers? I'll, I'll go over this one. Um, I think big data. In again, this is putting the kind of the, the SEO and search marketing cap on. Um, I think it's had a, a massive influence on what we do on a kind of like day-to-day -day basis with our job. Um, when you think about it, Google is, uh, you know, pretty much the original big data company. They were the ones, they were one of the first to be getting so much information. They've decided that they needed to do something, and I think it's all this kind of big data where kind of the, the Google Hummingbird algorithm came came about. You know, they they were analysing all this data, they were analysing how users were using the search engine, and they were trying to they were trying to look into the intent of uh, you know our searches. Um, so you know, kind of, we've ha we've had to adjust what we're doing as kind of search engine marketers, uh, you know, to based on the kind of findings of all the big data that they've been collecting. Um, so now with Google Hummingbird, there's a there's a lot more emphasis, uh, you know, around content, and you know, it, it's said to it's said to favour kind of conversational based search. So we, you know, we need to know that the content we're producing on places like our websites are answering you know the questions of our users. Um, 
we need to make sure that kind of important business information uh, on our website is kind of marked up semantically. You know, we're pushing that information. Um, you know, we need to use the blog to we need to use our blogs and places like that to answer these kind of questions that are, com are coming to us. So, you know, big, big, big data, uh, you know, such it's all this big data which has changed what we're doing. And even if you look at it in the terms of, of social, you'll, prob you'll probably be using social to pick up on kind of trends and insights and, you know, pick up on hot topics to see what people are, are talking about. So, you know, obviously it varies depending on the size of your company, but, you know, this, all this kind of data that's coming through from your kind of social profiles will probably, you know, help to form like your content strategies and the things you want your brand to be talking about. Um, so a lot of the data that I've been uh, working with is um, social data, obviously, is um, digital PR guy. Um, and one thing that I found really useful is to um, uh, use APIs of um, Twitter, especially, to um, to scrape the information and um, create audiences of people, find out who influencers are, and um, especially on um, on Twitter, find who. Um, the people you should be speaking to are, and then uh, following their journey as well. So w one thing that we did was using our uh, Google Analytics data and influencer mapping uh, information that we used with a, a bespoke um, tool that we created. Uh, we were creating content for, sure it was for a big wide audience of people, but really we were just focusing on one person. Um, one influencer that we really wanted to create our content around, so I'm back to content. Um, so we were creating this content that we knew this one, um, what this one man would be really interested in, and then uh, the idea is that he would then go and share that with his audience, and we'd never even really have to engage um, on on Twitter, which can always, you know, I think it's great for brands to engage on Twitter, but if 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 an influencer is doing that for you, then it's fantastic. And uh, it, it did work as well, which was, you know, always a bonus. Um, in terms of big data, I think, again, talking from a PR background, it's it's in really incredibly interesting um, because it removes the um, the researcher's paradox. So, you know, the idea that we th the number of PR survey companies that must be bricking it. Um, but I mean, basically, you used to be able to ask two hundred people a question. Um, and you'd get the answer that they want, wanted to give you, basically. Whereas now, there's no questions, the data's immediate, there's no delay, and you can get two million views on all sorts of different things, from government statistics, through to information in shopping baskets. Um, we actually have a client, so I'm just letting you know this is a client, but they, they're they called Shoppertize, and we've just started working with them, and they're incredible, because they the user of a smartphone takes a picture of a receipt, and they upload it that immediately and it recognizes all of the text, loads that into a database and you get offers on specific things um, by responding to questions, so you get money off your shopping basket basically. And, and I was thinking when I met them, how many people would take a photograph of their receipt? And they've got like 400,000 shopping baskets that they can analyze. And that's really interesting because previously that's the sort of data that only Tesco's would have with a multi-million pound project like Club Card. And that's one retailer, one specific type of demographic in you know certain areas. Imagine doing that across all retailers and on a budget that a small brand can use. But from a PR perspective, thinking in headlines, it means I can, I can actually prove that um, people buy more cigarettes when they're buying condoms or, um, you know, headlines like that we can pull out from genuine behavior rather than guesswork or algorithms because at the end of the day that never works. So it's interesting to, to be able to get a snapshot of people's behavior and I actually think the exciting part of big data is communications because that's what I work in. Um, and you'll see loads more um, really interesting correlations of actual behavior. Um, you know, the fact we can see government statistics is fantastic, you'll see more of that. The fact that you can see um, data on, yeah, how, how far people generally run, um, you know, and how fast they generally run, all that sort of information is interesting. Um, the wearable technology side is um, something I've not tried yet, but things like Fitbit and stuff like that are really interesting products, and people are genuinely into it, but I think that your know, wearable technology is your smartphone, effectively. Um, you know, there's going to be more and more apps, there's going to be more and more developments with smartphone technology. So, unfortunately, I think things like Fitbit, if it did take off, would just end up as part of the, the smartphone um, hardware anyway. Um, so, in, in, yeah, just to summarize, I guess it's all about the PR headlines for me, condoms and cigarettes. <laughs> Mock the week. 
Um, yeah, I mean, this is the subject uh, for me what uh, makes employees and clients either go for, to have an extended fag break, a trip to the pub, or extra caffeine. Um, I think that a lot of kind of the city stuff that I work in, they almost have a startup attitude where they would like to buy a huge data list um, costing thousands of pounds, and the data isn't particularly clean, it isn't targeted. Uh, they've given the brief out wrong, and there's a whole miscommunication area. So, a lot of the uh, nervousness has stepped into buying data lists for particular target groups. Uh, so, one of the things that we make sure we do is make sure that we measure the ROI really effectively. And if there is a list that isn't performing, it's out, or we just chuck it back to the agency. Um, and I think having clean, targeted data is the only way to go in the next 12 months because. Without it, you aren't going to increase sales or your brand awareness. You aren't going to achieve great customer satisfaction. You're going to end up with a load of rubbish spam emails and, and annoy a lot of people. So for me, clean, intelligent ROI on big data is absolutely paramount. Um, wearable technology was mentioned just earlier. Is wearable technology just a phase? Or, I mean, do you actually start to think that it might start helping people? Um, so this is um, sort of a hobby of mine, um, wearable technology and digital health, uh, cool guy, I know, not funny, uh, and in, <laughs> into that. Um, so I, I think wearable technology is really interesting, like Fitbits and Jawbone Ups and those kind of devices for tracking your steps. That um, They're definitely done by a bit of a nerdy, geeky crew of people and a small amount of people because uh, what a lot of people are trying to go to is the whole anonymous route which is the reason for snapchat disposable um, social media but so when people are putting on their fitbit they're giving all of their data to fitbit um, and I, in fact if, if you even want to actually access that data you've got to pay them another 40 pounds a year which is just crazy um, the data behind it though is really interesting um, I think the problem at the moment is Fitbit data is um, formatted one way, Jawbone Up data is formatted another, and all of these devices, they don't really link up very well, so we need we need a database um, to pull it together, and people are creating that. There's a service called TickTrack, which pulls in all of these things together, and then I think the importance is um, how places like the NHS can then use this data, and they're already talking to uh, uh, this this audience, the quantified self kind of audience and digital health audience to, to see how they can actually use it. Um, but I think there's loads of backlash behind it and I think I'm not sure if it would ever go mainstream. I'd, I'd totally be up for it. You know, I'd, I'd sell my data to a pharmaceutical if they really want it. Um, but I, I think uh, I think it's going to continue. I don't think it's a phase at all. Um, I think the technology is only getting better and I think the fact that it'll go into smartphones isn't uh, going to mean um, that, you know, I, sp I suppose the whole wearable part is gone, but I think the same idea and concept of people tracking their own data and creating their own body data um, is going to continue definitely, especially with, you know, Samsung have it in their phones, the iPhone has the M7, um, but I think it's going to be a, 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 a few geeky people that are really driving it forward. I'm not sure if it will go mainstream. Cool. So I found something in the last 24 hours that I thought would at least make us chuckle and decide whether this can be a long-term phase or not. So in the last 24 hours, Sony have uh, filed a patent for Smart Wig, which is a mobile computer you'll be wearing on your head. And I'll just read you a snippet from the press release to show how bonkers it is. Um, also, the proposed wearable computing device has the advantage that the user can instantly change his or her appearance by just changing the type, shape, and color of the wig, which I'm sure is going to be great if you're a shapeshifter or a mystique from X-Men. Um, and Unbelieve was uh, something that struck my unbelieve uh, was Make Believe, which I just thought was absolutely brilliant, really, because the PR people doing that were absolutely shocking, in my opinion. So, yeah, apparently wigs are going to be in computers. Not sure how we get that into a smartphone just yet. That I would want one. That's amazing. Um, I, I think from a, that that's a good example of um, of PR d driving something, though. Like, there's probably some guy going, yeah, we could put it in a wig, but we're not going to do that, are we? And then the PR guy's like, we are. Like that that's the sort of thing I'll be like, yeah, definitely. Like, that will get headlines all over the place. Um but I, I I think that 
wearable technology is interesting because there's two sides to it. One is that it will become part of the smartphone, like I said before, if it is mainstream, but there's not much that will be mainstream, but there's got to be a product that's there for runners and for enthusiasts in certain areas, and I think that will always be the case. Um, but um, in terms of the proliferation of it, I actually think that, yes, it will be embedded in the smartphone, but the smartphone will become more wearable. So if you look at Galaxy Gear, for example, that you've got the watch, um, which has a sort of a connection to your smartphone. I've not played with that yet either, so I don't even know what I'm talking about. But it, it is, it's a cool interface that's on your watch and then Google Glass and things like that. Um, there will be other components on your body that can have smartphone capacity. So, you know, will the iPhone, you know, launch a, a wearable version potentially? And uh, certainly with the fact you can have like slap on screens and all sorts of things now um, coming out of China. I think that's really interesting. So yeah, there's there's that side where phones might become wearable, but I actually think mainstream-wise, um, it's it's it is the only only thing everyone's going to have in their pocket. It's a bit like um, saying you know yeah, Facebook is is mainstream, but then you'll always have the runners' blogs and you'll always have the the communities built around specific interests, and I think that's the same with with hardware technology, but. The ex only example I can bring in would be something like Flip Video. Does anyone remember Flip Video? So, uh, yeah, about like a couple of years ago, oh, not a couple of years ago, probably, I'm showing my age now, probably about five years ago, I actually did the launch campaign for Flip Video in the UK. And everyone here would probably whip out their Flip Videos because cameras um, weren't in phones. But Flip Video, in, it was a small video camera, basically, that fit in your pocket. And it immediately went from startup to being the biggest selling video camera globally. Um, the top four, the top selling video cameras were all flip videos on Amazon within, I think, six months of launch, which is pretty phenomenal for a startup. Um, but then iPhone just went, okay, we'll put, we'll put video into our phones and immediately wiped it out. Um, and I think there's you know, capacity for if something does go mainstream, then there's no reason why you can't fit it in a smartphone and just make it simpler and unify all the devices. Um, but equally, Google Glass or, or the Galaxy Gear could kill the smartphone in the same way if it can do the same thing. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, glasses are wearable technologies, right? The contact lenses. So I guess they already are mainstream. It's just, um, you know, different types of, it, d it depends on your definition, really. Yeah, well, th there's only one kind of small part that uh, I would kind of add to the, the points already made. And I think one of the biggest things kind of uh, facing with wearable technology is the kind of design of the technology and how easy it kind of fits into your life. I think that's kind of like one of the major things and that's going to be one of the major things to overcome when seeing whether this kind of technology goes mainstream. I think you have seen industries where people will readily kind of embrace it, such as kind of like, you know, when you're looking at sport and health. Um, but for it to go mainstream, you know, it's got to fit in, you know, if people are having Google glasses, do they, do they want their Google glasses on a designer pair or something like that? I think these are kind of like further considerations and it remains kind of to be seen whether, you know, whether people will have We'll design kind of the technology that you know fits kind of like seamlessly into their lifestyle. Okay, um, great stuff, guys. Um, so, in this last year, one, one topic which we can we cannot uh, leave out would be, um, I guess, in terms of SEO, would be Google. Uh, we've seen some really significant changes in the algorithm this year. We've seen keywords be swallowed up. You know, we have no idea <laughs> what users are searching for anymore. We've seen um, changes with the Panda updates, Hummingbird. Penguin. Um, with obviously the significance of search and SEO, or, you know, search traffic uh, being as as significant as it is, uh, where is it all going? What what trends do we foresee in 2014? Yeah, um, well, th for me personally, moving into 2014, there's two two major things that I think are going to affect search. The one is what we obviously hummingbird. Um, for, for you guys that don't know, it was you know it was obviously a new uh, it was kind of like a whole refresh of the whole algorithm from Google, and like I said, it's meant to it's meant to favour conversational uh, or query based search. So basically, Google have identified that we're not you know we're not using Google to you know type in keywords. We're actually asking them questions. We're like talking to them as if they're our friend. Um, so what Google are trying to do now is they're trying to understand the intent of the questions that you're asking. Um, you know that means you know when I'm searching, you know wh where uh, where is uh, what place where is my local Tesco's? Uh, that that signal by asking where the, lo the location is that signaling intent to actually go out and visit that shop. 
So, you know, they, they kind of, they, they can pick up on that and you will kind of signal to them that you want to go out, you want to visit, visit a shop. So they're going to provide you with kind of like address details of the local places. And as, as, as SEOs, we need to do our best to, you know, like mark, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of kind of like schema.org, where you can mark up kind of the content on your website. I think that's going to become, that's definitely going to become more and more important. You know, we need to highlight the, this, these bits of information uh, to the users, you know, if, if you're a local business, you know, your address, uh, your opening hours and things like this, because these are the questions that people have asked of Google. Um, so there's definitely going to be this, this move towards semantic, you know, query-based search. So, you, like I say, trying to answer these questions with the content that appears on your website. Uh, the other thing I think that's going to be an even bigger shift is towards mobile. Um, I think it was in 2015, 50% of 50% uh, of internet users will be on mobile. We already know that mobile is a kind of like a ranking factor when it comes to the, uh, Google's algorithm, uh, but at the moment it's, it's only been said to it's only been said to favour kind of uh, searches performed on mobile devices. But I think kind of moving forward, if it does overtake desktop usage, then it's it's probably going to be responsive websites that just take favour over all kind of search results, whether it's on desktop, mobile, or tablet. Um, I'd agree on um, mobile definitely. I think that one really quirky stat that I heard uh, today is that more people in the world have a mobile than have a toothbrush, which is pretty disgusting. So, uh, so uh, definitely mobile is going to be really important. I think, um, I suppose I see it from a different angle because um, we're working with social media channels, things like that. And what we see is um, Articles are found and they're discovered through people who are um, sharing them on Facebook, on Twitter. People are grazing those channels to find their news. Um, search, um, people are still making as many search terms, um, search, inputting search um, terms into Google as much as they ever were, and that's only going to increase. But um, we shouldn't ignore that people are using Twitter more and Facebook more. And if, if you look at the shares, um, I remember. Um, a couple of years ago, an, an article on The Guardian, if it had 30 shares on Twitter, you'd be like, wow, that's a decent article. And now, you know, they're getting hundreds and thousands and BuzzFeeds go crazy, you know, thousands and thousands. And um, Upworthy.com just gets hundreds of thousands. It's, it, it's crazy how many shares that they get. And that's how people are discovering um, content nowadays. So a lot of the time, people are skipping out Google. So. Whereas Google is obviously important, it's the portal to the internet, it's the first point of call. Um, I think it's, we shouldn't forget the importance of how people are sharing their content on uh, social channels and the fact that so many people are uh, grazing these social channels for their news of the day. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not SEO brained at all. I, I know about SEO from a, a PR and social media background. Um, and I love the capacity for us to affect that, but also for SEO to improve the value that we can deliver to clients. Um, but it, from a technical standpoint, I'm not really a man. But I think what's really interesting is social search because everyone has, like you said, shifted to some extent from using Google to using Twitter, for example, to try and find something. Because if I need a new laptop, I'll tweet it. Anyone got any recommendations? Because you don't just get, you get four results instead of four million. Um, and it's not budget based, it's based on how many people are interested and probably their proximity to you as in terms of their relationship but you get a context. If my mum gives me a recommendation I'm definitely not going to go for that one. Um, you know, if my, if my best mate Bennett does then I'll be like totally I'm going to go with his point of view because he's much more of a nerd than I am. Um, and I think that's really interesting um, because Google have known that for a long time and have been building in the impact of social into search for, for ages and what I find interesting about social search is if I Google search on my mobile um, a bar near me, at the moment it shows me the nearest bar near me. That's awesome, right? That's amazing search technology that Google have, have built in. But the moves that they're making are also, there's a bar near you and then there's a bar that Bennett's been to recently, um, which is around the corner. And that's maybe not the nearest, but ob obviously I know that that's something that a place that I might go to, or there's a bar on the corner that my mum's been to, which is out somewhere I'm not likely to go to. So the idea for search to navigate my life is amazing, and that's what I think the impact of mobile is. But the the fact that you can add social context to all searches is phenomenal. Um, whether you're on desktop, whether you're on mobile, or, or whether you're using Google Glass, I guess when that when that launches. 
um, the fact that that everything has a context is is phenomenal and Google have done what I said the Guardian is doing with news um, they have never been a search engine Google have just owned search and wherever you search whatever you're searching for however you use it they build around that so YouTube Google Maps I think what you'll find is all of those products will become much more one thing and naturally become one thing as we require them all at once and when you layer all of that information and all of that knowledge that Google has on top of each other then it doesn't become a search engine it's a, it curates your world around you and that's what Google wants to be um, so they're getting there and I think this year we're going to see definitely a bigger step in that direction as smartphones develop yeah definitely agree <coughs> lots of good stuff going on there um, I think what's what's really clear is Google's kind of intention is to um, allow site owners to stop obsessing over keywords and perhaps try to put the content is key into your website and I think that that's really going to help uh, build relationships. I think the mobile optimization is going to be amazing as well. I think that when that drives next year it'll be a really good uh, format. Obviously we're, we're seeing 4G explode. What's going to be next? You know, I think we're just approaching 1% of the UK using 4G and they're responsible for nearly 20% of the data. It's an incredible statistic. So for me mobile optimization is just absolutely huge. Okay, um, last year on the panel, um, we discussed, and I guess this is kind of moving maybe more back to social, but we can kind of keep the, keep the flow with search as well, it depends entirely on how you take this question really, but last year on the panel, um, it was brought up that the audience is getting harder to impress. Has this been the case, and is this going to carry on? I mean, I mean we, are we all desensitized now as an audience with all these amazing ideas that have been brought to the table using video and social media? Yeah, um, I think I think when it comes to, uh, I think when it comes to the audience, I don't think they come becoming harder to impress. I think maybe as marketers we try to overcomplicate things. Um, you know, we're trying to be, we're trying to be we're always trying to one up our competitors. We're always trying to do one better than we did last time. Uh, and at the end of the day, you just need to make sure you clearly communicate. Uh, every consumer has a need. That's not going to change. They're going to you know there's, there's basic needs that people will have in life. Um, so I, th I think it's just about kind of like communicating, uh, communicating it effort, you know, correctly. Uh, and you know, the things that you need to be doing is kind of like you need to be testing out your communications as well. I, I think that's kind of like really important for you know, g gaining interest and gaining traction from any kind of advertising or communication that you're doing. Um, so looking as like search marketing as you know, you can do kind of like A/B tests on your website, uh, things like that, and see if that will improve engagement. <coughs> With PPC, you can kind of like trial trial different ads and things like that. So I think this is more is to kind of take in um, trying to understand more about your users. You know, um, try, you can do things like uh, stakeholder interviews with, with, with your, your business. You can do things like persona mapping. There's things out there you can do to understand more about your consumers and then tailor your kind of marketing towards it. So I don't I don't necessarily think they're becoming harder to impress. I think we. I think maybe in some cases we're just making life harder for ourselves by uh, you know trying to confuse them a bit. Yeah, I suppose I can add there. So for me, um, working in the kind of top-down approaches, it's great to have ideas at this level. Influencing your boss or your financer to uh, agree to those kind of things can be really hard. So particularly, 60% of the top firms in the UK do not have any social media strategy at all in place. They have a Twitter account and they think that's good enough. Um, and that's a significant challenge in this market when um, you know, consumers are driving it. Um, Lloyd's TSB are phenomenally poor at their social media uh, and they're crying out for help. They've got a massive marketing team, but again, buying from the senior exec team who don't really get digital marketing, who don't realize that you know, putting 100 grand a month into spend is just you know, not enough. Um, and people at HSBC who've got really bad online security. I don't know if you bank with HSBC, but I am one of those people who can't log online to my account because they bought such a complicated set of software that it doesn't allow me to get on. Um, and 13% of their customer base are finding it significant issues. And uh, you get people like Nat West come along, rebrand it as Nat Yes. They do it better, they do it simpler, they do it faster. They review their communication. They understand what the customer wants in greater detail and they clean up. Um, yeah, I don't know if they're harder to impress. Um, I think 
there's just higher expectations. I think, especially as a consumer nowadays, I expect to be able to communicate one to one with a brand, which I think is an expectation that's appeared for the last two years, in the last two years alone. And I think for brands, there's naturally going to be a catch up period. Um, but the interesting thing is looking at the opportunities, I guess, that a community that wants more involvement with a brand brings. Um, because the community can be the idea. Um, and if it is, then you, they're impressing themselves. Um, we work with, I keep bringing up clients, I'm not doing it on purpose, but we work with a company called Brewdog. Has anyone heard of Brewdog here? So when we met them, there were six guys and a dog. Um, and they turned over about 250 grand. This year, they're the UK's fastest growing food and drinks brand. Um, they currently will turn over about 20 million pounds. They've got 16 bars, and that's happened in two and a half, three years. Um, and they've not spent a penny on advertising or paid media or anything like that. And this isn't me bragging. This is talking about the community because what they've done is allow the community to invest in them. So no one had ever done that before, and actually no one actually has allowed people to buy equity in their business in the same way that Brewdog has. And we've run three rounds of funding for them. Uh, we ran one round and we got £750,000 from friends and family, basically. Um, and that took us about six months to raise it. Um, two years ago, we smashed all of the records by raising, uh, we aimed to raise £1 million in six months and we raised £1, £1 million in six weeks. Uh, we raised £2.2 million, 2 .2 million in, in four months and had to close because that was all of our equity that we had to give away. This year, we raised £2.2 .2 million in 24 hours. Um, we currently have 12,000 investors, all of whom have vested interest in promoting the brand and being part of the idea. We had the first ever crowdsourced beer called Mashtag, where they invented the ingredients. They invented the label. They, they developed the marketing tactics, said which bars it should launch in, and bought, sold, and dis distributed the product for us. It was, um, I think that is the sort of idea you'll see more of, and it's not that they're harder to impress, it's just they've got more of a commitment to a brand, and people like Brewdog are scaring the hell out of people like SAB Miller, who, who are trying to replicate that with paid media that might not necessarily be able to have the same community effect. And um, yeah, I think if you make the community part of the idea, that's exciting and that's something new and that's an opportunity. But the traditional show me a picture and I will buy it is not any more difficult than it was, but you're missing a trick because people buy a product, but they join a cause. And if they're part of your campaign, they're part of your cause, then they're going to go off and, and be your ambassadors for you and you'll grow much faster because of it. So I think that's really interesting um, in a, with a social media audience. Um, I think that, um, again, the, I don't think the, the audience is um, any harder to impress. I think it's just difficult to reach them, um, which um, for someone like Brewdog, who's an awesome startup and, um, uh, you know, drive tanks down the roads when they launch as well. Um, I mean, that's just awesome, and it's got that whole startup vibe to it, and the whole crowdfunding thing as well is really cool. But for a big brand, it's a lot harder. You know, they've got hundreds of years of history, and um, it kind of look a bit more stale, maybe. And I think, um, as sad as it is to say, as a PR guy who who really always wants to get organic, you know, um, third-party endorsements, I I do think that to to actually reach people through the you know the masses of content that people are putting out. Um, we are going to have to use um, social advertising to make sure that we're targeting them, um, even if we are creating great content. Um, it's it's kind of sad, but the social advertising is pretty decent, so we know that we can actually do it. And um, with um, more of them going for cost per action, um, we we at least know that we are going to get a result out of it. And if we don't, we don't we don't have to waste budget. Um, okay, moving on to the next subject as well. So we've, we've already mentioned mobile quite a few times. We don't want to, um, again, go, go over the top on it. I just wanted to know, uh, from your own experience, from the projects which you guys work on, um, how has the continued growth in mobile directly affected these strategies for you and your clients? Um, let's hop in. Um, I think the, the main thing is just um, whenever we're um, you know, building a website, building um, a, a content hub, um, obviously I love content, um, we, we just make sure that you know, it's, it, it works on mobile. I think it's a no-brainer. Um, uh, you know, I, I was um, 
the community manager for when we launched Windows Phone, and I think the f the first thing that we jumped in and said is we need to make we created a blog for them, and um, we we had to make it mobile friendly because it's going to be on Windows Phone. So, um, and I I think um, that's that's just a trend that people are going for, and mobile websites look great now. The whole um, design that people are going for um, is 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 just awesome with infinite scroll and. Um, the way they're laid out. I'm not. I'm no designer, but I'm always impressed by what designers are doing. It, lo it looks incredible. Um, but yeah, I think you just need to be mobile friendly. Um, you have to be. You know, th there's. I think 80% of people using Twitter um, are on mobile. Again, with Facebook, it's 50%. So um, you just you just can't ignore it. That's where people are. I think strategically, mobile is not really affecting anything because. Just like with social networks, I guess you've got to produce an idea that can work across the board. But ideas-wise and tactics-wise, it's really interesting because more people are willing to produce content on your behalf. And I think people creating imagery and creating their own content around your brand and then sharing that is interesting. It means we have to rethink the idea of who owns the brand because the audience does now, um, which is, I think, really interesting. But obviously, it's quite a risky business as well. Um, but yeah, strategically not changing anything, but the most interesting tactically uh, tactic element is that we can ask people to produce content and that's got much more reach than, than we can have. Um, and more and more people are willing to do that and able to do that with smartphones. Yeah, for me, um, my biggest uh, number one on this one is to turn all of these fancy words into videos. So I've been making sure that all CEOs who have three and a half hundred page PDFs, which you don't want to read any of them anymore, have a three minute or less video. You can feel the CEO, you can feel the tone and presence of the firm, you can see within the company, look at the corporate structures. I think that mobile users particularly want to see things a lot more faster, a lot more effective, you get on with it get to the point what's the point of the video and to be honest I'm, I'm starting even thinking the three minutes is a bit boring now you know most pop songs are three minutes and they get a bit boring at three minutes so maybe cut it to two uh, and I just think that you, the user experience through web and mobile content they've all been completely reviewed at every single stage I think it's really important it's basically three clicks to purchase and if it's four you've lost them Um, and as well, I think from from the kind of statistics we've seen as well, um, you know, we, we we still do have some clients that haven't got a mobile optimized website, and we can see how how big an impact that's having on the kind of like their conversion rates. Um, you know, I think t tablet and desktop are still performing pretty well, but when it comes to mobile, if you haven't got a mobile optimized website, it really kind of brings down the conversion rate, and I think you, you're probably missing out on a lot of opportunity, and it's only going to increase, so your conversion rate is probably going to only decrease if it's not something that you adapt to quickly. So. Yeah, for for me, it, it, mobile is important. For me, you know, moving forward, it's got to be responsive because it you know it has marketing benefits. You know, Google is what Google are asking us to do, and you know, it, maintaining a responsive website is also easier. It's only kind of a, it's only got one uh, code set, so you know you can update the website once. It's easier to maintain than rather having an app and a website and a mobile optimized website, which you know you'd have you know you have to update three separate things. So um, yeah, um, just. Uh wrapping up but to the final sort of topic of the evening. Um, we're just going to talk about, I guess, strategy as a whole. Uh, so based on, I guess, what the things which we've been talking about, on the things which you guys have been reading and everything which you've been working on, what would be, what would you say would be um, the main, sort of main things to look out for for the small to medium sized entities you know, in terms of their strategy for 20, 2014? What, what really should, should people be doing when they're planning now uh, for the year ahead? Um, there's a few things I think people should be doing kind of moving forward with their strategy. Uh, one thing 
one thing I think was quite uh, important to touch upon um, is the fact that kind of Google are encrypting, uh, starting to encrypt more of their search queries, or starting to encrypt it all, so that we can't see the keyword data that's now available to us. Uh, if you know search marketing is a, a priority for you, so you know, trying to if you're not already doing, I think investing in kind of like a PPC campaign or expanding your current PPC campaign is becoming more and more important because you know it helps us to form our search strategies. You know, there's a lot of useful data that's been taken away from us, but PPC we can still retrieve that data. Uh, so for me, you know, it's, it's looking to get around the kind of uh, uh, you know the curveballs that Google are throwing are throwing at us, um, and I also think just kind of like like testing and trial and error really is something we need to be doing whether it's with our websites or whether it's with our search campaigns or social media you know just trial and testing new things and seeing how they work I think you need to constantly be looking at especially when it comes to things like your website you need to constantly be looking at it constantly looking for improvements uh, you know and seeing ways that you can improve the experience for the user so you know they can they can adapt and you know you pr you're providing them with the content they want in the easiest way possible really I think um, when it comes to SMEs, we, we might be preaching to the choir because they're, you know, often more agile than bigger brands. Um, they can they can make shifts and they can just choose to take on um, new channels when they see their audiences, you know, on on there. So, um, but in in terms of some tips that you know they they may already be doing this, but I think um, knowing who your um, brand advocates and your detractors are is really important and we can use um, social channels to do that. Um, we can look at what people are saying on Facebook and what people are saying on Twitter and then we can map them using you know the the API that they make available to us and there's a few tools that you can use and uh, you just need to scrape the data and then chuck it into node Excel or something and then you know create maps of people who you should focus after um, and that also can solve the problem as well so if brand if if people do want to have conversations with brands then that's going to be incredibly difficult when um, you know you're um, a, a huge brand with millions of customers and they want you to respond to every single one it can be really funny with the way that um, some of the conversations that they do actually choose to respond to um, I think um, the, there was like a, a multi-brand Twitter conversation the other day. Um, if you search for it on BuzzFeed, I can't remember. Do you, do you remember the name at all? I can't remember who was on it, but I think it was like, yeah, Cadbury's. And one of them, one of the brands looked like they were drunk on there or something as well. It was crazy, just weird conversation. So I think um, it's kind of a digression. Knowing your audience is really important, and I think um, use the social tools that are available to try and find where they are and then use that to choose where you go for your social strategy. Don't just always think Facebook and Twitter and a blog. Um, you know, we, we've been talking about the niche social sites um, that are available. And, um, think about those too. If, you, if your audience is there, then go there. Um, yeah, I think all of those are really good points. I think from um, a broad strategic point of view, advice for next year, um, in three words would be grow a pair. Um, I think there's I have no idea when it happened, but as a communications person, it really frustrates me. When did it become okay, or when did the response, nobody does that in our industry, become a reason to not do something? Like, oh, no one in our industry is on Facebook. No one in our industry produces content like that. Um, so, you know, let's not do it. Everyone idolizes the pioneers, the people who, who strap on a pair and go do something different, um, and then they just copy them. Um, why aren't any people looking for new things to do, exploring new avenues? Because in a digital age, it costs you very little now, and the potential return on investment of being the first people to do it, the pioneers, that's exciting. Yeah, when you're raising, trying to raise money selling shares, drive a tank into the Bank of England, it'll get you noticed. Um, you know, those, those are sort of ideas where if, if someone says to me, we can't do that, there's no way we can do that, I think we're onto something. Um, and I feel like more brands are waking up to that, but they tend to be the smaller um, businesses or the medium-sized enterprises that are looking to disrupt a market. If you're going to disrupt a market, do it. Um, you know, try something new. What's what's the worst that could happen? Um, in reality, I think those um, those impacts are minute compared to the potential benefits of um, of what could go right. And I think Brewdog is a good example of that. Looking at the uh, the research earlier from toothbrushes and mobile phone, I think I'd be going out and getting a toothbrush in my mobile. I think that's just genius. Um, I think everyone needs to have that in their life. Um, I think my main uh, comment would be on top of that would be be careful if you spend. 
uh, I think that if you're not sure about something, and we were talking about earlier about trying out the little guys, I think that's something I'm going to take into work tomorrow with clients and say, why don't you just market test those little guys? Because they might be actually more effective than we give them credit for. So just because they're not up there, they still might have a pair of balls downstairs that they can really kick ass for us. So I think that be really careful your content spend as well and make sure that you measure really effectively. You've got to really understand what that means for you because it's, it's your hard earned money, your investors hard earned money, let's make it a good return and then try and build a lifelong relationship. If they're a really good small company, grow together. There's loads of value add you can have as a team. I think that's really important as well, develop long term trust within those guys. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the Digital Fund Marketing Panel.